Welcome to Living Free Today, a ministry of Cornerstone Fellowship in San Lorenzo, California. These podcasts are the weekly sermons of Dr. Michael L. Wilson. You would turn in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 57. Psalm 57 is another psalm of David. We have seen psalms where David has been running from Saul. This is one of those. The title says, To the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy, a mictum of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. And the series of events after David ran from Saul, after Jonathan warned him, is he went to the priests at Nob, and he got the sacred bread, and he got Goliath's sword, and then Doug came, and he killed 85 priests and their families. Then David went to Gath, the Philistine stronghold city, and they had already received news of his reputation, that Saul had killed 1,000, David had killed 10,000 Philistines, and so they wanted to get rid of him, and to, he got out of that by feigning a mental illness and being a crazy guy. So they kicked him out as opposed to, to try him for his crimes, and he went into the wilderness, and he found a cave, and he found a cave that was well defended, that he could see enemies that were coming, and this gave him a chance to, to re- mentally regroup. He is still alone. He is still not sure what God is doing or what is going to happen next, but at least he is not being actively chased by the Philistines or Saul. Of course, he's in a cave, and most caves don't have grocery stores in them, so he had to find fresh water and food, so he had to leave the cave and go back, and that was kind of his home base. And we know from 1 Samuel that he would leave and send messages that were kind of encoded spy messages to his family, and then they would send messages, and over the next several months or even a year, his little band of supporters grew to 400, and he had 400 people living in this cave, which shows the size of the cave. It was a large cave, and from that he was able to created defense for the Philist- against the Philistines and a defense uh, against Saul. But right now he is alone. He is trying to regroup. And this gives him a chance to, probably during this time, is when he wrote all the previous psalms about the previous occasions. Uh, even though they're, they're very emotional psalms, we, we don't imagine that as he's running through the wilderness, he's pulling out a pen and paper and writing a psalm. He waits and he thinks about it. He probably prays about it. We know these are inspired, so he's carried along by the Holy Spirit. And he starts, as he does with many of the psalms of being chased by Saul, by saying, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. He says it twice. And as I've said before, even David, who we say is a man after God's own heart, even though you think you may think of the most righteous person you've ever met in history or alive today, everybody but Jesus Christ deserves the absolute wrath and eternity in hell from God. We deserve nothing. We bring nothing to God that he considers valuable, that he is not impressed by anything we do. Our stance before God, even as a Christian, is one of needing mercy, of needing blessing. And we sang the song about how the variety of ways that God will take care of us and some things we don't want and some things we do, but it is always a merciful act of God to do anything based on love, to do anything based on care. And so David puts his whole life, as it were, in a proper perspective by saying, as he does here, have mercy on me, and it would be a good idea, it wouldn't be bad, to start your prayers, for example, as you pray. You can say, Our Father who art in heaven, have mercy on me. 
and throw a couple mercy requests in there to put your mind in the proper respect that you're not coming to God demanding something. You're not coming to God with a deal. You're not coming to God with a plan. You're coming to God with nothing. And you're asking for His mercy. And then He confesses His trust in verses 1 through 3. He says, I take refuge in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge. I cry out to the Most High God who fulfills His purpose for me. And we've talked about what it means for us today for our souls to have a refuge in God. There is not a physical place that we can go. Back when the temple was built under Solomon and from that point on it was considered a safe place to be in the temple, for example, when the Babylonians and the Assyrians were coming in, the very righteous manipulative people would go and they would hang out near the temple because they believed in their mind that God would never destroy the temple. And so if they were hanging out in and near the temple, the whole force of the Assyrian army can come and they would be safe because God would protect his temple and would protect everything inside. That is not true. That did not happen. In 70 A.D., as a matter of fact, they took every stone apart from the other, and the temple was a pile of rubble as Jerusalem was emptied of all the Jews. So God does not hold, for example, his temple above his righteousness or his holiness. If you turn his temple into a sinful place, then he will destroy it. And for us, we do not have a physical temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the Holy of Holies. We've talked about how this sanctuary is kind of a, a picture, if you will, of the inner part of the temple. You have the courtyard, which would be the lobby. You have the holy place, which would be this room. And you are the Holy of Holies. There is not a place where we can go to be in the presence of God. You are in the presence of God. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit within you. And so, what do we do today if my soul wants to take refuge? Very simply, it's three things. You stay in God's Word, you stay praying, and you stay in church. If you do those three things and you, you bathe your mind with the things of Scripture, you bathe your practice with the things of church, when things go south and when you are really in a tough place challenging your faith, your mind will be used to thinking about things God's way because you are regularly in His Word. Your mind will immediately go to prayer because you are in a prayer attitude in your refuge, and so when you are exposed, as it were, out in the world, you can still pray, and you know that there is a church family that is here to support you. You are not alone. He then says, in the shadow of your wings I take refuge. People will look at this and go, well, God doesn't have wings. I know God doesn't have wings. God is a spirit. God doesn't have anything physical unless he makes it like his representation when he's sitting on the throne in Revelation, for example. That is not the totality of God. That is a representation that he is showing so he can participate in the events of Revelation. And so God presents himself throughout the Old Testament as having a strong right hand. He doesn't have a hand, but that's a symbol of strength and skill, the right hand. He is the... the Mother hen, as it were, or the, the eagle bird of over Jerusalem and wants to shadow them. When Jesus cried over Jerusalem, he said, Would that you would allow me to gather you like a hen gathers its chicks under her wings. And the idea is if you got a powerful mother bird, for example, and the chicks are all within the realm of the wings, nobody is going to get to the chicks. You are fully and absolutely protected 
if you are in the shadow of God's wings, and that also for us today would show a, a closeness, that if I am as close to God as a chick is to its mother, that it can be in the shadow of the wings, then I have a relationship, I have a walking, we say walking close to God, we say we have a nearness to God, and then when things get difficult in life, we can rely on this nearness to God. It is a mental refuge, it is a spiritual refuge. And then he says, till the storms pass by, and he's not making a deal that God saved me during this tough time, but as soon as you take care of Saul, well, I'm not following you anymore. What he's doing is he's saying that this is a special, really difficult time, and we have these in life. We can go along and things seem to be normal. We have enough money in the checking account to pay the bills. Our lights aren't being turned off. We're not living in the middle of a fire that's going on and destroying our neighborhood. And various things we can look and say, well, this is comfortable, it is safe. I can go home and it will be safe. We don't stop relying on God just because we're having some comfort and contentment and safety. We don't save God for the difficult times. We are not, as it has been said, foxhole Christians. We do not follow God until the enemy goes away. However, he may seem a little more important. He may seem a little stronger and a bit more close, as it were, if you're going through a major tragedy or a major catastrophe. These are times when we throw ourselves on God because we do not know what to do. He calls God the Most High. This is a, a rare use of the word Adonai that is used in the Psalms. David usually uses Yahweh, the covenant name, but he is using uh, and the, the word for God that was used when God first showed himself to Abram. God identified himself as God the Most High. We would say God Almighty. The literal translation is God of the mountains because if you want a good position in a battle, you want the high ground because if you're on the high ground, you can see everything and the view is if God has his armies on the tops of the mountains, you can't beat him. And so that's where we get God most high, we get God almighty, we get God strength. It is what this is showing. This is showing that in this period in David's life, he needs God to be a soldier. He needs God to have an army. He needs God to be strong. And he refers to God that way to show that heart. And he says that God is not doing this. In verse 3, He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. And so David finishes this section by stating in essence, not because of anything I did, I don't deserve this. You are saving me. You are bringing me through this. You are bringing and giving me love and care because of your steadfast love and faithfulness, not because I did anything, not because I'm worthy. And that is the teaching throughout Scripture is that God, God loves us. God sent His Son God does all this saving work and is our Savior because of His steadfast love and His faithfulness. Because of who He is, I am saved, not because of who I am. I do not get God's attention and Him say, huh, well, that's worth saving. God in Himself and His steadfast love for His broken, evil, corrupt creation saves David then goes into a section through 4 through 6 where he talks about the enemies. He calls them ravenous. He says they're lions, they're fiery beasts, or literally beasts of fire. 
but you can't translate it beasts of fire because we don't know what those are. So people translate it fiery beast. Their teeth are spears, their tongues are swords, they set traps and they dig pits. I was reading one not very good commentary that was saying that when David goes into these explanations of bad people, he is really uh, hyperbolic. He's really going over the top. He's trying to uh, get people on his side by saying that they are ravenous beasts and that this doesn't really exist. There's nobody like that is what these are saying. And I think that people who say that sort of thing don't look at the world today and say, okay, is there real evil in the world today? And I asked myself that, and the first thought I came up with was North Korea. North Korea is a bad place if you get against the single guy who's in charge of it. He will shoot you with an anti-aircraft gun. He will feed you to dogs. He'll drop you out of helicopters. His brother-in-law was at an airport and he convinced some ladies to poison him and he died because he was afraid of him taking over, that there is no accountability for this guy and he doesn't choose, as will never happen, nobody, when there's no accountability and they have all the power in the world, they will always choose evil. There is no leader in history that you can mention who, when they finally came to power, turned their country into a loving, kind utopia. People at their core are evil, and if they reach to power, like Lenin, like Stalin, like Mao Zedong, like Hitler, like all of these that you can name, all the real evil people of history... These are people who are just living out their natural inclinations. They're just doing what they want to do because nobody can stop them. And if you are in, South Korea, in North Korea, you would consider the secret police lions and fiery beasts. If you are under persecution in China, in Indonesia, in Russia and the places where they're imprisoning Christians and putting them in re-education camps to torture people until they recant God, you would say that you're being attacked by lions. We have a, a very special place in America these days where there is no open persecution. However, if you were the owner of the Masterpiece Bake Shop in Colorado, and the Colorado government comes after you and tries to fine you and put you into jail so that you will not make an immoral message cake. And it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court didn't say he was right. They said the Colorado government was wrong, and then the Colorado government came at it again, but... The ACLU stepped in and it seems to be stopped currently. But if you were the owner of that bake shop where all you want to do is make cupcakes, ever since you were a kid, all you wanted to make was cupcakes and wedding cakes and tasty little baked treats. And for close to two years, you had to stop doing that and you had to play lawyer and you had to go to court after court after court after court and to be destroyed in the press, to be called all sorts of names, if you were in that bake shop during that time, you would definitely say that those against you were lions, they were ravenous beasts, they were beasts of fire, they set traps for you, they dug pits for you. So there is true anti-God movements that are out there. And do not believe for a moment that David, knowing that the Philistines are after him, knowing that Saul is after him, knowing that Doug is after him, that everybody he knew in his early life was after him, he could definitely say that they are lions, they are fiery beasts, their words and tongues are swords, and they are against him. But what is his conclusion? He concludes in 7 through 11, 
My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. He starts by asking for mercy twice. He ends by saying, My heart is steadfast twice. So what does it mean to have a steadfast heart? It means that your heart is standing for God. We have the the imagery of the full armor of God. The full armor of God is not there for for attacking, for being a commander of armies. The conclusion after you put on the armor of God is to stand. All we have to do, all we're commanded to do, and every Christian is commanded to do this, is stand. When the world comes against you, when your family comes against you, when finances or health or anything else the world can throw at you comes against you, when you can't think of anything that happened today that was good, when all that comes against you, you can look at yourself and you say, I am standing for God, that the world cannot knock me over, that the world cannot stop me, that whatever comes to me, if I am confronted, saying, recant their belief in Christ, deny Christ, I will stand firm. And I will stand for Christ no matter what I do. And so the conclusion is he is a man, David is a man who stands for God. His heart is steadfast, immovable. The King James says fixed. It's not moving. It is stuck. It is stuck on God. He will sing praise. He will be a praising sort of person that... Because he can look and say, Philistines can't touch me, Saul can't touch me, Doug can't get get me, all the other armies that are out there can't get me, I will stand for God. And his conclusion is to sing praises and to tell people about it. And it ends in 10, saying the reason once again, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds We are not anything that impresses God, but God loves you and he's faithful to you. And if God makes a promise for us, it would be through the person of Jesus Christ. If he makes that promise, he is going to follow through. You are secure in God's economy. We need to be steadfast as we stand for God. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for this idea. We thank you for this thought. We thank you that even in practice, the Christian life may seem very, very simple in theory, but in practice it is impossible. I pray that you would keep us in your word, you would keep us in prayer, and you would keep us in church, that no matter what the world throws at us, we will be able to say, be exalted, O God, above the heavens, Let your glory be over all the earth. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this day. I pray that you would cause us to stand firm as we go from here. And we ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen. Cornerstone Fellowship is located at 180 Llewellyn Boulevard, San Lorenzo, California. Our Sunday morning service is at 1045 a.m. Our website is livingfreetoday.org and our phone number is 510-278-2622. May God continue to bless you as you serve your King. God bless.